Raheem Morris has assembled a young coaching staff, and one of those young coaches might be the key to unlocking Kyle Pitts' full potential. You are Locked On Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back, everyone, to another illustrious episode of the Locked On Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, your team every day. And today's episode is brought to you by Fandle. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets. If your first bet of $5 or more wins, visit Fandle.com slash locked on to get started. And guys, if you don't know me, I'm your very humble host, Aaron Freeman. Uh a.k.a. Sirius Black, a.k.a. Mr. Drew, a.k.a. Mr. A.k.a. Been covering the Falcons for far too long, formerly at falcfans.com, R.I.B. Still going strong on this illustrious podcast, and I appreciate each and every one of you that is an everydayer of this pod that makes it your first watch or your first listen each and every day, and all you got to do to become an everydayer, follow in their footsteps by subscribing or following for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to to podcast. So today we are kicking off our positional reviews of the defense, starting with the edge rusher position, right? We started with the quarterback position when we did the offense two weeks ago. We're starting with the edge rusher position uh, today, arguably the two biggest needs on the team, right? We'll talk about Arnold Abiquetti's season in 2023, his expectations moving forward, Zach Harrison's fit and potential changing role. What is the potential of Calais Campbell to return to this team and some of the top edge rushers that the team could target in free agency in the draft this all season. But of course we start things off as we have done. So over the last week, which is talking about, you know, the most recent coaching hires. And there was a bunch made over the last couple of days since we last did this episode on Thursday night slash Friday morning, whenever you tune in to this podcast. And We'll only talk about a couple of them, and I think the main one that I want to talk about is the new tight ends coach, Kevin Kozier, uh, who spent the last three years with the Chargers, and then pre prior to that was an offensive quality control coach with the Packers, and in that time, and while he wasn't directly coaching the tight ends uh, in Green Bay, you know, Jimmy Graham happened to be uh, one of the tight ends in Green Bay during those years, and the last three years, he's worked directly with Gerald Everett and Jared Cook. And I think what's intriguing about those three guys is those three guys are similar in terms of usage, in terms of Kyle Pitts and being those sort of flex tight ends, those quote unquote hybrid receivers, whatever you want to call that tight end, rather than the sort of traditional Y or inline tight end that we talked about before, where if the Falcons went in a certain direction at the head coaching position, like Bill Belichick hiring Josh McDaniels, you know, they would want, they would probably move off of Kyle Pitts because he's not the sort of traditional hand in the dirt inline tight end that those offenses typically prefer. And I think the move to Kevin Kozier is the first real indication that, you know, this new Zach Robinson offense under Raheem Morris is going to be able to integrate a co a tight end like Kyle Pitts, right? Because when you look at the Rams offense over the last couple of years with Sean McVay, their primary tight end has been more of that wide tight end in Tyler Higby, obviously Gerald Everett prior to his arrival um, in uh, in LA with the Chargers did play with the Rams uh, across town as well. But I think this is a promising sign that, you know, Kyle Pitts isn't going to be sort of counting his last days as we talked about a couple of weeks ago when we talked about the tight end position in terms of, you know, that potential hire affecting his future. And so this is the best indication that I think Kyle Pitts could be fully unlocked under this regime and he'll be playing a long time in Atlanta as opposed to what we were talking about two weeks ago, which is, you know, maybe this is his last year. Maybe the Falcons are going to shop him this offseason. So I think that's the most notable of these most recent hires in terms of Kevin Kozier, in terms of being a guy that is comfortable working with Kyle Pitts's type of tight end. Uh, and so that should be a, a promising sign for what his future can be here in Atlanta. Now, when we talk about some of the other hires, you know, Barrett Rude was hired as the inside linebackers coach. He uh, played in Tampa Bay for the Bucks when Raheem Morris was a coach there, uh, you know, 15 or so years ago. Uh, he spent his 
only coaching experience was five years under former Nebraska head coach Scott Frost in recent years. Um, the fact that the Falcons gave him the title of inside linebackers coach to me is notable because it suggests that the Falcons are going to hire an outside linebackers coach, which, again, is another indicator that the Falcons are going to be more of a 3-4 and lean on the 3-4 when it comes to their quote-unquote hybrid uh, defensive front this year. The other hire is uh, – you know, secondary coach Justin Hood, who's most notable for being three years as a defensive quality control coach with the Packers, um, overlapping with Jerry Gray. Then now we've talked before about Raheem Morris and Jimmy Lake and Jerry Gray being around. And so the fact that Justin Hood doesn't have that experience of coaching a secondary, I don't think is a is an issue just because, you know, he's an ascending coach and he's getting that real first opportunity here in Atlanta. So we'll see what he can do. But you do have a lot of experience, more experienced coaches uh, in terms of Morris and Lake and, and Gray coaching that, you know, secondary as well to aid Justin Hood as he, he, you know, gets his feet wet and whatnot. Now, the Falcons also hired a bunch of offensive and defensive assistants on offense. K.J. Black, Tim Burbinich, uh, Chandler Whitmer, Burbinich and um, or Burbinich. I don't know where the emphasis is, if it's on the right syllable uh, when it comes to how to pronounce Tim Burbinich or Burbinich. Um, but. Burbanich and Whitmer are labeled as passing game specialists, right? Um, and Ken Zempezi was also hired as a senior offensive assistant. And Zempezi is notable because I think I believe, if I'm not mistaken, he's the only coach on this coaching staff that has any NFL play calling experience from his days coaching under um Marvin Lewis in Cincinnati for a couple of those Andy Dalton years in like 2016, 2017. So, you know, in the event of things going awry with with Zach Robinson or whatever the case may be, I would imagine Zampezi would be the, the first guy up to sort of fill in. But I do think guys like K.J. Black, you know, who worked with Robinson with the quarterbacks, you know, in terms of the reality, again, this is me speculating, but in the reality of where Zach Robinson is is a home run hire as the offensive coordinator and he, you know, departs in two or three years as, as a head coach somewhere else, you know, I would imagine K.J. Black would be, you know, one of the front runners to to potentially replace him as a play caller, in addition to you know T.J. Yates as well, uh, who's going to be the quarterbacks coach. So those would be the two names that I would circle as sort of the back pocket sort of developmental guys that the Falcons may coach up as um, you know the Zach Robinson successors. Um, we'll see what how that goes, but. Defensive assistants, Lance Shelters and John Timu. Lance Shelters, we mentioned before, he was a teammate of Raheem Morris at Hofstra, uh, dabbled as a defensive assistant with the Rams and uh, the Falcons uh, under Dan Quinn. Uh, John Timu, I believe, was most recently with the Chargers or with the Rams. It's hard to remember exactly. But Timu also played under Jimmy Lake at Washington uh, several years ago, basically a decade ago. So um, the thing that stands out, the last little tidbit we'll say about this coaching staff is how young they are, right? Of the 11 main position coaches hired so far all are under 50 seven are under 40 40 or younger and roughly half of the staff about a dozen of the guys hired so far are 40 or younger and so this is a relatively young coach I don't, again i don't know how they rank uh in terms of the other 31 teams in the nfl but i would imagine that this is one of the youngest staffs that has been assembled so far in the nfl going into this 2024 season and it's notable to me because we talked about this in contrast to the idea of the Falcons hiring Bill Belichick, which is much more of an old school and a much smaller coaching staff. And he has trouble relating to players. And I don't think that should be an issue with this regime moving forward. So I think that's a very promising side that this, the direction of this team is to continue building with youth and whatnot, as opposed to sort of that more old school mentality of, of going after you know veteran proven players or whatever uh but you know I, I would imagine the falcons might look for some veteran type of players this offseason given how young they are especially on the offensive side of the ball uh but we'll we'll see how that goes and we'll talk about the defensive side of the ball um starting with the edge rusher groups and we'll talk about arnold abiketti's season and sort of the roller coaster ride that was at least my expectations for arnold abiketti and whether or not he lived up to those expectations as we continue today's locked on falcons now guys with the upcoming big game doordash is going to be crucial for you in your watch party whether you're looking to order wings pizza soda burgers, nachos, chips, dip, whatever you crave, DoorDash has you covered from your favorite restaurants, your retail, and more. And even if you have all that covered, 
right now you've already gone out shopping and you realize last minute, oh no, I forgot the buns, right? DoorDash has got you so that you can kick back and not stress before kickoff and you can get 50% off up to a $10 value when you spend $15 or more on your first order. Just download the DoorDash app and enter code LOCK23, subject to change, terms apply. Again, that's 50% off up to a $10 value when you spend $15 or more on your first order when you download the DoorDash app and enter code LOCK23, subject to change, terms apply. Don't forget to use that code LOCK23, L-O-C-K-E-D-2-3 for 50% off up to a $10 value on your first order when you download the DoorDash app and spend $15 and more subjects to change terms apply and passion drive patience these are what bring home the winning trophy and it's also what keeps your number one ride or die alive and ebay motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers roof racks exhaust kits led headlights and more whether you're into speed power or style ebay motors has got you covered with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die you'll always find exactly what you're looking for and with ebay guaranteed fit your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back because with ebay motors you're burning rubber not cash baby with all the parts you need at the prices you want it's easy to turn your car into an mvp and bring home that win so keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com eligible items only exclusions apply ebay guaranteed fit only available to u.s customers so before we talk about the falcons edge rushers Let's plug the Locked On Sports Today 24-7 streaming channel right here on YouTube, the first of its kind, giving you all the updates you need for the biggest stories across all the leagues across the world. And if you're looking for the latest updates for all the leagues, for the teams in your neck of the woods in the state of Georgia, check out Locked On Sports Atlanta's 24-7 streaming YouTube channel as well. So, um, you know, Edge Rusher is going to be a priority. This offseason for the Falcons, you know, probably arguably second biggest priority next to quarterback this offseason, as I talked about at the top of the episode. And we'll talk about sort of what we could see for the Falcons, you know, in terms of offseason changes a little bit later. But first, let's talk about what we saw this past year in 2023, especially from the three young guys that we can be say with absolute confidence will be back here in Atlanta in 2024 because you know uh, bud dupree i was about to say jermaine dupree stuck on atlanta uh, bud dupree and calais campbell are free agents lorenzo carter could be a cap cut so we'll talk about their potential futures and their potentials to return uh, a little bit later but let's start with arnold abiketti and as i suggested earlier it was kind of a roller coaster of expectations for me personally with abiketti because if you go back to june it was like oh he's going to be our sort of ace alpha pass rusher he has that potential to have that breakout year and then by the time we get to August, once we get to the preseason, uh, those expectations, for, at least for me, just basically evaporated just because I saw the Falcons using him on special teams in the preseason. And I'm like, well, you're not asking your ace pass rusher to play, you know, be a four core special teams player. And so that all clearly indicated to me that he was going to be more of a role player and that lowered my expectations. Now, he wound up being that sort of designated pass rusher, that DPR type of role, which primarily meant that he played in nickel situations, although we did see him uh, in base defense when the Falcons did run you know, uh, their 4-3 under front as that Sam linebacker. Uh, he wound up playing about a third of the snaps, typically 35, 40% of the snaps are you know what your typical dpr designated pass rusher will have you know you go back to dwight freeney back in 2016 when he had that same role a similar role um you know he played about 37 38 percent of the snaps so um we did get that seven game stretch in the middle of the season with arnold epiketti where he had five and a half sacks uh you know finished the year with six sacks and i remember a listener asking me during that stretch if if I thought Arnold Abiketti had sort of turned a corner because he was racking up the sacks. And my response was kind of no, right? Um, you know, I, I thought Abiketti did get better as the season wore on. Um, but, you know, I don't necessarily think that, like, that production was a byproduct of, like, him taking a, this big leap as a pass rusher, right? Like, um, you know, Pro Football Focus credited Arnold Abiketti with 28 pressures. I credited him with 30. And pretty much with the one exception of Calais Campbell, like, my charting pressures charting the defense this year was within two or three pretty consistently of pretty much everybody on the defense except for Calais Campbell. Um, but what I charted watching the defense was 
I had him with 30 pressures and exactly half of those were quote unquote manufactured or scheme stuff, which I attribute to being unblocked pressures, coverage sacks and pressures, cleanups, uh, stunts and whatnot, right? Where it's more the scheme or other circumstances leading to you getting production rather than you yourself just going out there and beating the man in front of you. Um, and so that's part of the reason why like some of the metrics with Arnold McKinney, especially at PFF with like their pass rush productivity, I think make him look better than what he actually is. Uh, when you look at his, like his pass rush productivity, he was by far the best player on the Falcons roster. But when you look at his win rate, he was, he, he dropped down the fourth on the team behind Campbell, Jarrett and um, you know, David on now, that being said, I am optimistic that Ebiketti can build off of this year and see we can see what he does in year three. You know, I think when, for when you're a technical pass rusher like Ebiketti is, a guy that tends to rely on technique and, and pass rush moves rather than just I'm bigger, stronger, faster than you, you know, it's usually that third year where you see the guys sort of click, right, when it comes to technique. Um, and, you know, it'll either click or it won't for him, and, and he should make that leap this year. But I don't have the sort of expectations that I once did, especially immediately after we drafted our, our excuse me, Arnold Abiketti, which was that he could be the quote unquote alpha. He could be the quote unquote Batman. He could be the ace in terms of our pass rush, right? That sort of perennial double digit sack guy that we were hoping for when we drafted him. I see him more as probably a guy that's going to be a perennial six to eight sack guy, which is perfectly capable as a starter you know like i feel like he's on the path to, for my eye level comparison that i had of him when we drafted him which is harold landry now i know harold landry the last two seasons that he's played he's gotten double digit sacks but it's not because harold landry's like consistently winning he gets a lot of cleanups and and coverage sacks and, and those types of things that sort of pad to his total so i feel like that type of player you know whether we're talking about harold landry we're talking about arnold abiketti is more the robin that sort of complimentary uh, pass rusher in that tier. And I, I think Ebiketti is well on his way to being that type of player, but in terms of being more than that, you know, I'm not having those expectations, but I would love to be, you know, wrong on that. Now talking about D'Angelo Malone, uh, the player that was taken around later in that 2022 draft, he only played three snaps on defense last year. And, um, you know, if you listen to this podcast in July, we talked about how D'Angelo Malone didn't really have a path to playing time. Now, granted, I did not think he was only going to play three snaps. I would have guessed probably 30 or closer to 100 snaps um, this past year. But, you know, three snaps on defense, you know, he, he primarily was a special teams guy. And, and so that changes the expectations for D'Angelo Malone, who I know a lot of people expected, you know, who, who didn't realize he was going to not see the field this past year, you know, sort of saw him as a breakout candidate. And, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens with – um, D'Angelo Malone, but when we talk about sort of my initial, you know, projections for, for these players, my floor comparison for, uh, D'Angelo Malone coming into the league two years ago was Marquise Haynes. Now, I know a lot of you guys probably like who's Marquise Haynes, right? <laughs> but he's basically been a backup sort of a rotational player for six years in, in, in Carolina. And basically in those six years has averaged about two sacks and, and about 12 pressures a year. And that's kind of what he is. And, you know, I would like to, I would, I expect more out of D'Angelo Malone in 2024 than what we got in 2023. But to me at this point, and he's got to prove that he's not a replaceable player and not just a special teams guy that can, you know, give you 15, 20 snaps a game and, and, and bring something to the table more than that. So we'll see what happens with D'Angelo Malone. Um, I do expect him to, to stick around, but you know, I think the Falcons at this point in time, depending on how much they're willing to invest at that edge rusher position, could easily upgrade that spot from him and he could enter training camp on the roster bubble. Now, talking about Zach Harrison, he got off to a relatively slow start. We knew he was more of a project uh, when we drafted him um, and we were optimistic on you know what Ryan Nielsen could do with that project over time. Obviously, uh, that didn't come to fruition with Nielsen departing after Arthur Smith's firing. Um, you know, last month uh, to Jacksonville. Um, but we did see development from Harrison over the course of the season, right? That final four or five games that he had, starting with the Jets game and thereafter, he played really well, right? And, you know, part of me wants to argue the fact that he missed that Saints game was a contributing factor to why the Falcons look so bad. Not to say that he single-handedly would have, you know, stopped the Saints, but I do think they did miss him in that game with having another player that could be an effective um, disruptor on that offense defensive line. Now um, 
the biggest issue we saw in terms of growth from Harrison and why he was better in the second half or down the stretch was because he was coming off the ball. Like he, you know, his snap timing was very poor at the beginning of the year. It was poor at Ohio state. And he started to finally sort of realize, Oh, when the ball snap, I don't have to wait a full second before I can get off the ball. And it led to him uh, being able to, you know, impose his will a little bit more effectively. And uh, the other thing I liked that we saw with Zach Harrison down the stretch was he was more of that bully, right? And we talked about his link with his length and his power when we drafted him. It's like, you, you're a bully, be a bully. And, you know, at Ohio State, he's trying to be all this little sort of technical guy with the swipes and all this stuff. And it's like, you're not Nick Bosa, be a bully. And I think he did a better job of that towards the end of the season. Now, obviously, with Nielsen's departure, you do wonder a little bit if he can continue this trajectory in terms of his developmental potential. Um, you do wonder, again, with the expectation that the Falcons will be more of a 3-4 in their sort of hybrid defense than they were last year in, in, under Nielsen. Um, you know, I don't think Harrison's going to be a true edge in that regard, you know, being an outside linebacker. I think you're probably going to bulk him up and make him more of that sort of five tech, four I sort of classic three, four defensive end. And I think he should fit fine in that. He has the frame p- potentially, I think, to pack on another 10 or 20 pounds. And, you know, given his strength and his power and all that stuff, again, I, I do think he's a good fit in that role. Uh, we did get to see him get some reps down the stretch over that final month, you know, kicking inside. And I thought he was effective when he did get those opportunities. So I do expect him to kind of fill the Calais Campbell shoes uh, in terms of that sort of hybrid edge D lineman inside outside sort of player. Um, You know, and I think he does fit, you know, whether we're going to be a four, three or three, four, I think he can work. But obviously I think if we're going to be more of a three, four, you do want a little bit more mass on his body. But speaking of Calais Campbell, um, you know, whether or not he's going to return, right? Let's talk about his future. Let's talk about Bud Dupree, Lorenzo Carter's future, and, and dive into how aggressive the Falcons could be in terms of attacking their needs on the edge rusher as we wrap up today's Locked on Falcons. So happy Super Bowl to all who celebrate, and that's from FanDuel, America's number one sports book. If you're like me, Super Sunday is all about scoring, whether you're scoring the best seat on the couch, the best snack, the best drink, or placing some super bets. And FanDuel is finding ways to get you to end this season with multiple W's with some of their prop bets. You know, you can bet on which team scores first and whether or not they win the game or which team scores last and whether or not they win the game. You can bet based off of points scored in the, you know, intervals of game, the first minute of the game, you know, three minutes in, five minutes in, 10 minutes in, the last two minutes of the half. You know, FanDuel, of course, has you covered whether you want to bet, you know, these props, you want to bet the spreads, over-unders, all that and more. And right now, new customers, if you join today, you'll get $200 in bonus bets. If your first bet of $5 or more wins, all you got to do is visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. So wrapping up today's Locked On Falcons, before we get there, if you continue to make us your first listen, tomorrow I'm sure we'll be talking entirely about the opening presser um, of, from Raheem Morris that is due on Monday, February 5th. And depending on you know how, how much we can glean from that, that could be the entire episode and that would push the D-line review uh, to later in the week or that also could be on the table tomorrow. We'll just sort of play it by ear if there's, you know, we can really dig in to all the the sound bites and clips from Raheem Morris at that opening introductory presser. So we'll see on that front, but continue to make us your first listen. Now talking about the future of the edge rusher position, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, Calais Campbell and Bud Dupree are both free agents. Lorenzo Carter is a potential cap cut. So we could see the Falcons moving on from three of their four primary edge rushers this past year. Um, And, you know, that would open up a pretty big void in addition to just the simple need of the Falcons just need more juice as far as their pass rush is concerned from this edge rusher position, period. They just need more bodies. Now, Campbell, to me, was the most productive pass rusher for the team. Uh, I think PFF had him with 42 pressures. I clocked him with 52, and I just think, you know, I I realized pretty early in the season there was like a game early where I think they only gave him like two or three pressures, and I gave him like six, and I was like, oh, like he was collapsing pockets, you know, that I think – should have counted as pressures and and PFF clearly didn't agree, but that's fine. Um, You know, I thought he got off to a relatively slow start as a pass rusher. His run defense was outstanding throughout the entire year. Um, But, 
I think once we got like, you know, five, six weeks into the season, you know, I think he's got his first sack against the commanders uh, in week six or seven or whenever that was week six, I think that was. Uh, and then from that point on, he was much more effective and, and consistent as a pass rusher from that point on. But we saw him play a lot of defensive end. We did see him kick inside uh, at points in the season and particularly in the final month of the season. I think the Falcons were much more comfortable with him and Anya Mata, uh and, you know, the combination of AK, Dupree and, and Carter sort of being their primary four or five man rotation. Now, um, in terms of his future, he's going to turn 38 in September before the 2024 season starts. And while I would love to have Calais Campbell back, I don't expect them to be back. Now, I wouldn't say it's impossible that he returns. I'm certainly he'll consider it. I'm sure he'll take his time weighing his options like he did last offseason. Uh, but we know that Arthur Smith and Ryan Nielsen, you know, were big reasons why he came to Atlanta and why he believed into Atlanta. And with those guys gone, you know, uh, I imagine he will have less of a compulsion to uh, stay in Atlanta and try, you know, to find another opportunity elsewhere. He's already indicated that he does plan to keep playing. Uh, we'll see if he changes his mind on that. The other factor, the third factor, uh, is that he also cited Desmond Ritter, his belief in Desmond Ritter as the Falcons starter moving forward as a reason that attracted him to Atlanta. Um, you know, whether you ag- believe that or agree with that remains to be seen. But, you know, Ritter also is likely to be riding the bench this year. So, again, you know, over three in terms of the, the big factors that led him to Atlanta in terms of what will likely keep him in Atlanta. So we'll see about that, but I'm not going to hold my breath that Calais Campbell is going to be back next year, but you know, I love the season that he wound up having here in in 2023 for the Falcons and really came through for this football team. And again, would love to have him back, but we'll we'll just sort of have to see about that. Now, Bud Debris is another player that I don't expect to return. Um, You know, I know much was made during the season about why is he getting more snaps than Arnold Ketty? To me, it was fairly obvious that you know, if you understand how this defense wants to play with lighter boxes, you need to have better run defenders out there. And Dupree, to me, was significantly a better run defender than Arnold Ebiketti. And that sort of overshadowed the fact that Ebiketti was a slightly better pass rusher than Bud Dupree. But, uh, you know, I, I wasn't I was never a big fan of Bud Dupree dating back to his days in Pittsburgh. But he kind of grew on me as the season wore on. I, I learned to appreciate his value as a role player. I think he did his job, you know. So I got no complaints about the one season that Bud Dupree had here in Atlanta. Now, Lorenzo Carter, another role player. The Falcons can save $3.75 million by cutting him uh, in March when free agency begins. That's a definite possibility that I think the Falcons will potentially explore. They don't necessarily need the cap space, but if you know this new regime has a different vision for what they're looking for, um, at that edge rusher position, you know, they could decide to part ways with Lorenzo Carter, uh, especially since his cap hit is going to be close to $5 million this year. And, and, you know, you don't want, (laughs) that's, that's the issue with Lorenzo Carter is like, he's going to be making close to $5 million and he's ideally like a third or fourth edge. And that's a lot of money to pay for a quote unquote backup. Now I do think Carter does have value you know, due to his coverage ability, his versatility, his ability to set the edge against the run, his power as athleticism. Like he, I think he does bring something to the table, but is that worth $4.75 million? You know, again, each person, uh, has a different opinion on that. And I'm betting the majority of you probably don't think he's, his value is worth that type of money, but we'll sort of have to see about that. So, you know, I think the Falcons will have an opportunity to upgrade that spot in free agency. Um, you know, Adi Ogundeji is still on the roster. I expect him to be kind of a camp body. He's, he was on the roster but entering this summer. I don't think that's going to change next summer. You know, the top free agent edges are going to be Brian Burns and Josh Allen of Carolina and Jacksonville, respectively. Pro Football Focus is projecting both of the guys get tagged. I think that's almost a certainty with Burns. You know, with Nielsen being in Jacksonville, Josh Allen's not his typical type of DN. So I do wonder, like, you know, 80% chance he probably gets tagged. Now, if that's the case, then probably the top 10 edges on the market are going to be guys like Daniel Hunter, Bryce Huff, Chase Young, Jonathan Grenard, Josh Uche, Jadavion Clowney, Leonard Floyd, Dorrance Armstrong, Carl Lawson, Yannick Ngakwe. If I was to pick my guys, I'd probably prefer Uche and Lawson just because I think you're going to get a lot better bang for your buck with those guys and some, you know, getting into a bidding war for Bryce Huff. Uh, now, Uche and Lawson aren't great run defenders. And again, that's an argument for why you, you might keep uh, Lorenzo Carter to sort of play some of those base downs. 
Leonard Floyd obviously has a connection with Morris playing in LA also is Georgia native. So that makes sense as well, but he's 32. So he's an older player. Um, you know, in terms of the draft, I think there's a pretty good chance that edge rusher might be the Falcons number eight overall pick. Um, you know, Dallas Turner of Alabama, I think is probably your best bet, but I think Jared Verse of Florida state, Layatu Latu of UCLA also in the mix. Chop Robinson of Penn State, you know, is not getting the same buzz, but, you know, he's expected to test really well at the uh, Combine. So he could be in the mix uh, by the time we get there uh, to April. You know, I think Turner is probably the the high ceiling guy, you know, a little younger, a little raw, but I think has the physical tools that you, you covet at that position to, to merit being a top 10 pick. Uh, Latu and Verse, I think, are probably the higher floor guys just because they're much more developed you know, in terms of pass rushers, they're a little bit older, about 23. Um, you know, I think they have more developed rush plans entering the NFL, but you do wonder, you know, from a, an athletic standpoint, do they have the sort of upside to be significantly better players than what they are today? But at the same time, people said the same thing about Aiden Hutchinson, and he, he's looking pretty good right about now as well. So uh, we'll see how that goes. You know, I haven't really studied a deep dive on this edge class. So I, I do know Caden Ellis's younger brother, Jonah, out of Utah is highly talented and might be in the mix in round two if the Falcons go in a different direction in round one. So those are just a couple of names to keep an eye on. We'll see what the Falcons wind up doing at this edge rusher position, but I do think it's going to be a priority uh, early in the draft as well as free agency to upgrade that spot. And we'll talk more about the D-line group later in the week. We'll give you a recap of Raheem Morris's introductory press conference on tomorrow's episode. As your first listen, continue to check out Locked On uh, Falcons. Um, check out Locked On Sports Atlanta, check out Locked On Sports Today, check out Locked On NFL, Locked On Chiefs, Locked On Niners. It's all part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.